Welcome to Build Your Best Business. I'm your host, Eric Holtzclaw. Build Your Best Business focuses on the entrepreneurial journey. What does it take to successfully start, manage, grow, and eventually exit a business? Today, I am talking with Kristen Andre with Andre Consulting Group. She is also, and she's a chief strategist, just like I am. How about that? We have the same yeah. title. So Very we'll just good. be strategizing all afternoon. Here we go. And she also has a podcast called No Limits. Yes. Correct? Yes. Absolutely. No limits. So tell me a little bit about what you do with Andre Consulting Group. Yeah. And then also the No Limits podcast. So the Andre Consulting Group, I started about nine years ago, and I focus mainly in two main areas. I work with financial advisors and financial companies, okay. and I work with female executives and business owners. So two different markets, but they do tend to overlap a lot. Um, about half my practice is private coaching. So okay. I work with them individually on business strategy, on mindset motivation, and really breaking through limits that they may have uh, keeping their business the from no growing. Limits. Such the no limits. There we go. <laughs> so, you know, that's about part of it. And then I do a lot of speaking engagements and workshops, create a lot of online content. And then recently, as you mentioned, we launched the No Limits podcast, just trying to get out to a broader audience. And, you know, we were, we were having so much fun with our clients and they're growing really well in their businesses and personally. But what we're finding is that, so many of them, they either have limits that they're trying to break through that they put on themselves or ones from the business or personal life that we just want to share more stories. Mm -hmm. So the podcast was a great way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That's and the reason that I did this as a research project back in 2012. Okay. So I was like, I want to know why small business owners fail. Like, that's what I want to know. And so we did it thinking it was going to be money or it was going to be lack of resources we learned something completely different, which is why I continue to do it. But okay. the stories are very interesting. So female financial advisors and female entrepreneurs are financial advisors. Financial advisors in general. So okay. male and female. Got it. Um, it's a very male dominated industry. Yeah, yeah. And so ac I'm across the board, I do have a lot of female financial advisors, which I absolutely love working with because it's a great industry for women. Um, but in that industry, it's really any advisor. So. Is that your background? Because I thought it was something else. It, you know what's interesting? I am I am <laughs> politically like, or not politically, professionally all over the board. Me too. So I like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> my my degree is in physical therapy. So I did physical therapy and athletic training. So I had a sports medicine background for a while. Okay. Um, I did that about nine years. Loved it. Um, it was a lot of fun. But I, I moved into administration pretty quick, and I found myself bumping up against the salary cap at the ripe old age of twenty nine which is not fun. No, and right. so I started exploring some other opportunities. I really thought I'd go into sales, thought I'd go into medical or uh, pharmaceutical sales because that made sense. Mm -hmm. um, but actually started looking at finance and had a few interviews in the, the insurance and financial arena um, thinking this will be great interview experience. So that's why I went on the interviews. But the more I got into it, I love the industry and the career. Okay. So completely changed careers at the age of 30. Oh, wow. And so moved up in that career, had a great practice, really enjoyed it. But I got to the point where I wanted to do something different. I wanted to expand out and be a little bit. I have that entrepreneurial spirit. And yeah. I, you know, same thing. I was bumping up against some limits that I was ready to just break through and go out on my own. My brother-in-law sells body parts. That, is that legal? He sells like <laughs> <laughs> hips and hips, okay. elbows and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Like you're talking about being the medical yeah, sales. Yeah. I always kid that if you ever had a car wreck, they wouldn't know how many people were in the car. Oh, gosh. That's terrible. <laughs> Hopefully anyway. they're not used by No, parts. these are new ones. <laughs> okay, well, that's you good. Know, like if you, have, if you need one, like yeah. he's the guy who shows up and he tells good the doctor know. how to put it in, now, which know. should worry you in many ways. But anyway... <laughs> I digress. So, but financial advisement, in my opinion, and correct me, so were you underneath a bigger practice? Because that feels very entrepreneurial. Like typically it, it when you go out, you got to like find a book of business you and do. you got to like all that, right? You do. It, it was very entrepreneurial and it is, you know, so even if with, you're with a large firm as I was, it, you're still building your own practice within that. Right. So there, there is a, a sales component to it. You do have to get out, meet people, find clients, build your own book of business. I really enjoy doing that. Um, and I moved into management and oversaw about 40 advisors. And I found myself liking the aspect of my job that let me help them grow their practices yeah. more than I did meeting with clients. So as I started looking into that, I was like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. And I want to do more of it. And, you know, I'd written a book and done some other things and some speaking. And, you know, the company started going, yeah, why don't you keep all your ideas with us? So I, I got to the point where I wanted to have a broader, <laughs> a broader impact. So right. um, I branched out on my own. Very nice. Very nice. It's kind of interesting when you learn, because I'm like that too. Like I have to do the sales part to, to eat. Oh yeah. Um, right. But I really love nurturing teams and yep. a lot of what I sell and do is just about 
making people think about it differently and right. how they interact and right. what that kind of thing. So so what are some of the limits then? So if you're you're trying to get people past limits in the financial advisement category, right. what what do you find that they run into that's holding them back? You know, I think a lot of times there's some that they put on themselves. A lot of times it's mindset and motivation. Um, it, some people come into the career thinking it's just going to be easy, and it's not. I would you know, never think that was an easy. It, some career. people go, come in though, and the they're number like, networking it's events just I go to, to that have financial advisors. Right? I'm like, no. I keep telling you're the twelfth I've met. I keep telling my guys, minutes. I'm like, don't tell people what you do. <laughs> They'll run away from you. But it's it's really just. Um, I think the biggest limit I'm seeing is it's in their head. Yeah. It's there's an art and a science to it. And the science is that you have to get a certain number of clients. You have to see a certain number of people. You have to be busy and have some activity. But the art part of it is you have to be different. Mm -hmm. So there's so, like you mentioned, there's advisors all over the place. And to the extent I'm working with them, I'm trying to get them to be themselves and not seem the same. You know, okay, there's so a I wanna, sameness. In so the I industry. totally want to understand that because there's a networking event here in Atlanta that mm -hmm. I will not go to. Because they're all over the place. Yeah, it attracts hundreds of people. It's okay. a really big event. Yeah. And I promise you, if you go in the first 10 minutes, 12 people yep. will walk up to you and you're like, what do you do? I'm a financial yeah. advisor. And I'm like, I don't have that much money. <laughs> yeah. Like I couldn't spread it out enough for it to be <laughs> interesting to I need like one. one to <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, right? yeah. It's, you know, what's interesting is, is I feel like there's such a technical component to finance and you know, that you've got to understand that part of it and understand how to manage a portfolio and understand how to take care of risk management and all other types of needs. But at the same time, you have to be human. And most clients are looking for the relationship. And I typically tell my advisors, they're not buying your company. They're not buying, I mean, the market is the market. You're all investing in the same thing. So to the extent you can treat them like a person, get to know them, um, really get to know their goals, personally, professionally, financially, and build a relationship. That's how you get clients. Yeah. So a lot of times with the advisors I coach, it's just helping them just be real and be them and get so then, get involved with their clients. So what is your advice for, there's a networking event, there's yep. 30 guys or gals there that are financial advisors mm -hmm. all walking around with their cards and they yep. run into me who's like, oh no, if I see another one, I'm going to run yeah. away. Like what would you do differently? I wouldn't talk about what I did at all. I'd ask you about you because mm. I'd want to know about you yeah. because for two reasons. One, you know, I'm curious and I want to get to know you as a person and what you do as your business. And I always tell my advisors and any clients, even the, the women I work with outside of finance, it's be a resource first. Yeah. So if I can find out about you and get to know you and make an introduction to somebody that might be helpful, that's my goal. Right. You know, so I, I tell them when they go to events, find three to five people that you have a great conversation with, whatever it's about. It could be about and, sports teams or whatever and just build, start to build a relationship. And so what she just shared is the smartest sales tip you will ever get look at that it is yeah. the the best sales guy i ever worked with in my career he would talk about how he never told anyone what he did yeah like and i would watch him like he would sit and he would talk to the person and he yep. would ask them a thousand questions and they would tell him all about themselves right and at the end they'd be like yeah, i really like you i know because i didn't people, know anything about what him. do people like to talk oh, about themselves right. right so you get to know and you're you're now if you're naturally curious and most of the top advisors that I work with that, that do well in their business, they're naturally curious and they just like people. Right. You know, I don't, well, you can sniff out the salesy folks in any industry mm -hmm. in a minute. Yeah. And they're, they are the ones I, I tease when I teach events or workshops on networking. I'm like, there's the, the card gatherer, you know, which is the same <laughs> guy that's giving out the pens, you know, they're just going around <laughs> and doing that. But you don't want to be that. Right. You want to be the, the connector. The right. one that's like, you know what? I connected with somebody. I'm like, you need to meet so-and-so. Yeah. So that, that's fun. It makes it way more fun. Yeah, it is. And, and and that's a way that you're memorable at the end of the day is when yep. you've made that, oh, you're yeah. looking for somebody who does this. Like, you know, exactly. who, who could I put you with? Yep. So uh, so you do workshops and also one-on-one -on -one then in that space, yes? Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so breaking into that, like, was that just natural? Like you, because I mean, you're, you seem like a natural salesperson. Like you're totally not me. Like I am <laughs> not a natural salesperson. I don't know so. that I'm a sell. Well, you know, I, I played sports growing up, so we sold those candy yeah, bars. Right. So if you sell those things, <laughs> we have donuts, candy. I think we sold suntan lotion one year. So, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't think of myself. I'm just naturally curious. I like people. Um, uh -huh. I'm naturally curious about them. And I think more than that, I, I like to help people. Yeah. Like I want to find, I, I'm that connector. I want right. to say, oh, you need to know this person. So, you know, when I branched into it, it was by happenstance. I just, you know, like I mentioned, I went on the interview and said this was a good career. I mean, I, th I think what kind of 
But I mean, I'm talking about the conversion. Like, as you decided to go from doing financial advising yeah. to deciding you're going to help out, help financial advisors, right. right? Was that just a very natural thing for very you? Very natural. What's it? What's interesting is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Strengths Finder mm-hmm. that Gallup does. I'm yeah. a huge Strengths Finder right. fan, and I took that assessment when I first became an advisor, and I would say I was using maybe two of my strengths, mm-hmm. and naturally over time. I started, the, the strengths that I wasn't using was were maximizer, communication, strategic. And so over time, I started getting really excited about helping the other advisors grow their practice. I would get more excited when one of the advisors that I worked with or that was under me grew, you know, landed a great client or grew their business or had a, you know, 50% increase in their their book, I would get way more excited about them than I would about me. Yeah. So then I started thinking, all right, this is really that maximizer strength come <sighs> into play. But so I got to the point where I was like, that's what I want to do the whole, yeah. all the time. And I was really fortunate in my firm. I was a managing director for my firm. Um, weren't a lot of females in that role. So that was part of the decision as I felt like as a female, I had more opportunities, you know, globally. And my managing partner was a great friend of mine, still is. And he said, you know what, I think you're going to have a huge impact even bigger than this office. Yeah. So was very supportive when I decided to launch out on my own. He yeah. was actually my first client. And that's the, so, that's the yeah. right way to do it, yeah. right? If you can, yeah. you should go out with that first client, Exactly. Right? Don't just exactly. go out and be like, it's really cold out here. <laughs> I, know, there was, I had kids, they eat, you know, they need food. So. <laughs> oh, that eating thing, exactly. you know? <laughs> and, yeah. and so you talked about a book. So did you, what was it, what's the book? The book is funny. It had nothing to do with finance. It's called, um, Don't Make Me Pull This Car Over. It's a roadmap for the working mom. So, it, you know, I, I don't know how many times you've been, had that said to you or uh, maybe said it yourself. But I, found, I, I have a, I have a, I'm an only child. I have, I have an only child. So oh, yeah, she I've, just spoiled. Got She's a, out in the back. You know, mine are spoiled. Download but I've got stuff a slew off the of Kindle. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> well, I think the thing, what made me write it was I had so many clients when I was still practicing and had a book of business, a lot of my financial advising clients were females, yeah. executives, kind of like the, the women I'm coaching now. And they all um, had similar challenges and issues in life and balancing work and their business. And, you know, my goal as their advisor was to kind of take the financial piece off their plate. But what I was finding is they all had a ton on their plate. Mm-hmm. And the book is really almost like a workbook. You're going through it, trying to figure out what is it you really want to do? Because even the people I had that were outwardly successful, that look like they had it all were miserable. Yeah. And so it was really an effort to try to help people understand what it is that's going to make you happy personally and professionally and kind of develop a, a roadmap to get there. So, but as they were kind of, you know, and I, I should probably leave that. I want to know what they were miserable about. So when we get back, well, nope, don't tell yeah. me now. <laughs> okay. You're, you're an old, <laughs> you're, you've done this enough now, you know, we want to give them a reason to come back. <laughs> All right. To come back. So when we come back, I want to talk about like maybe what are some of the patterns of things that were making people miserable and Perfect. how many of those did they really have? Like, how could they change them? Because there's some of those that you feel like you can't change. Oh, good stuff. Okay. All right. So we're we talking today with Kristen Andre, Andre, Kristen Andre, yeah. Andre Consulting Group. She's also a chief strategist. You're listening to Build Your Best Business. I'm your host, Eric Olska. We'll be back in just a minute. Eric, tell us about Lightering Works. So Lightering Works is a company that helps other businesses in one of two ways. Okay. So your company is either growing and you're not exactly sure how to keep up. So you need to scale operations, maybe raise some money, those kind of things. So growing too fast. Growing too fast. Okay. Or, yeah, growing too fast. You got okay. kind of structural, you walk in every day, there's a fire. Uh, you've been doing it longer than three years or a thousand days and you still feel like you can't step away from the business and take a vacation. So we help companies on that side. So sort of operational support, looking at their financing, seeing if there's a way that we can help them you know, get to the next level. Or you're a company that's not doing any marketing at all. So you are maybe stalled. Your business has gotten to a certain level. You make a certain amount of money every year, but you've never gotten above that. And we come in and build marketing structure. So both of them are operational at the end of the day. It's about creating a process and a way to approach it that's strategic. Uh, It's that uh, owners don't often know how to do both of those. So they're really good at sales, which means they may need operational structure because they're out signing more customers than they know what to do with. Or they've built a beautiful product that's the best kept secret. And so they need somebody to come in and help them market that product. 
And so that's the kind of businesses we look for. We come in as a stopgap and we work with a company for somewhere around 12 to 18 months typically, uh, solve those problems for them and leave them better than we found them. And we're back. You're listening to Build Your Best Business. I'm your host, Eric Holtzclaw. Today, I'm joined by Kristen Andre. She is with Andre Consulting Group. Just Andre Consulting Group. Just Andre Consulting Group. Okay. Chief Strategist and something else, you said, right? You've got two titles. Oh, CEO and Chief Strategist. Yeah, whatever you want to call it. Whatever. (laughs) You can call me whatever. That's right. (laughs) As long as you Chief Strategist, though. It sounds like yours. It sounds very, very official. Very official. I was like, oh, that's the Chief Strategist. So... (laughs) We are not any normal strategist we're just here. The chief ones. We are the chief ones. <laughs> so uh, we were talking before the break. You wrote a book called "Don't Make Me Pull the Car Over," mm-hmm. right? And this was primarily at kind of working mothers. Yes, yes. it's yes. not because you know I sometimes feel like I should say that to my <clears throat> CEOs that I'm working yeah. with. You know, it, don't make me pull this car <laughs> over. Don't make me stop. It's universal. The the right. concepts in it are universal. I wrote it for working women because that was a lot of who I was working with. Um, but the concepts are across the board. Yeah, because a lot of my work, so I, I think I shared with you, I do marketing, mm-hmm. which is psychology because I'm trying to understand their customer and what their customer wants and how their brand is approached. And then I do a lot of operational work. And the operational work is therapy. Like people think yeah. I'm in their chain, but I spend hours behind closed doors with a CEO and I'm the only person they can talk to and I'm going right. to hang with them. Right? Like right. their employee can't hang with them. Right. Right. And right. they'll tell me like, Absolutely. some of their employees are like, Try, they tried to lay all the stuff on me and I'm like, I'm, that's why I'm here. Right? Yep. You tell me anything, you know, problems at home, whatever it is, because it all impacts business. Exactly. If you're running a business, it's not like you leave it one place or the other. So one of the things that you said that was interesting to me is that you, you know, take people through kind of this workbook or this mm-hmm. understanding and they may appear to be, to have it all together, but right. behind the scenes they're miserable. Yeah. What, what would they might be miserable about? And then what would be the advice? Because often I feel, often I know people yep. don't think they can change it. And that's where I think they're wrong. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, uh, most of the time I'm seeing them, they, they just get stuck where they are. A lot of times they hate where they work, mm-hmm. who they work with, what they're doing. And so my, you know, my, I, we were talking about this earlier. I, you know, my well, tagline like, is like, I tolerate no BS. <laughs> I'm like, why are you there? Right. I mean, that's because sometimes your boss isn't going to save them. Why are you here? They want you there. They need you. Or if you are the boss, you're not just like you mentioned, you're not going to sit there and complain about the people working with you. But it's always within somebody's power to change. Yeah. Always. They well, may and not it's funny because it people is. do take the power away. Because I, I sure. had a business partner at one point and I was more important to the relationship than he was. And yep. that sounds really No, 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 and, but I get it. Yeah. And, but he was always the one threatening he was going to leave. And it was, I was scared of it. And then I'm the one who came in and I'm like, you know what? I'm leaving. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Like this is, and he was like, oh, whoa, oh, right? right? So you don't right. know where your power is sometimes. And sometimes we give it away. Yeah. And I think that's more, you know, working with a lot of females, they do that more often. Yeah. I mean, not to mm-hmm. be stereotypical, but it happens. So the challenges I was seeing with a lot of them is they were staying places that they didn't want to be. Um, and I still see, I see that with men and women, right. you know, so I, I have a, a good friend who, you know, has a job that they hate. And I'm like, then why are you here? Yeah. And I said, you've lost, you've lost the right to complain unless you're going to do something about it. Right. You know, cause then it just becomes whining. Right. So, <laughs> and, yeah. and no whiners. Exactly. Right? No whiners. But it, that, that was a big one. It's just most people, not most people, a lot of people are stuck in situations that are 100% controllable yeah. for them to get out of or to change. Yeah. And so going to walk delicately into this conversation, but I think it'll be okay. So the nature nurture concept, because you talk about Mm -hmm. it primarily female. Yep. What I see is it's, it's if people have been taught, they have a place like stay in your place. Yeah. It, and that is a more typically done more to females. It's typically taught that. Yeah. 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 To males, it can happen right where it's like, I see it probably equally as many men. And and I think it is, It's interesting because a lot of the females I have the opportunity to work with are in more senior positions. They tend to be very driven type A. Um, it's our, our little tribe. So we haven't, we don't really do that. I mean, it's, I, I don't see that from my, from my client base. They're pretty assertive and pretty direct, right. which is great. But they had to, they may not have always done that. Um, I would say the people that are more assertive and direct have role models that have taught that. Yeah. And so, so there's the, definitely a learned behavior. Yeah. And so talking about this podcast as a, cause you'll, you'll find this interesting with the psychology piece of it. So I've done all these pro, all these interviews and what I found is that entrepreneurs fall into two categories. Okay. So they're rectifies okay. and magnifies. 
Okay. A rectify is somebody who's trying to prove somebody wrong yep. by building their business. And while that sounds awesome, that works, but at some point they realize that's what they're doing. Yep. And that becomes a little bit of a problem, right? Yeah. Or they're magnifies, meaning that they feel like they can do no wrong. They're invincible. And so my favorite example is Steve, Steve Jobs from uh-huh. Apple. Yep. You would think he's a rectify because he was adopted. So adoption okay. could be one of those things that makes you a rectify. Like okay. You're like, someone didn't want me. Right. Got it. And that's exactly what he said to his parents. He was eight years old. He went to his parents and he said, mom and dad, I, I was adopted. Someone didn't want me. And his parents said, oh, no, no, Steve, you don't understand. We chose you. Oh, that's cool. And so from the age of eight, he yeah. was told he was chosen. And that manifested yeah. <laughs> into <laughs> he is the chosen everything yeah. that man yeah. did. You know, he didn't follow the rules. He went to school and didn't yeah. actually enroll. Like, all of that came out in this magnify. So he ended up building this great company around right. it where most entrepreneurs are on the other side. Like yeah. they've got some wound that they're trying to fill. They've got something and they're going to prove everybody wrong. And I huh. tell people like if you had too much of a, if your bringing was too good, you probably won't make it. Yeah. <laughs> you it's won't, true. yeah. <laughs> probably won't make it that way. Yeah. You need kind of the middle, middle right. ground upbringing. I agree with that. Yeah. Now, is there anything in the middle? Rarely. So okay. rectifies and magnifies are typically nature and nurture. There's okay. people fall into like three categories within that, right? Got it. And it can be later. So like you could have the social contract was broken. So like you're 40 and all of a sudden the company you've worked for for years let you go and that's where you yeah. thought you were going to retire and you have something breaks. And then that's the reason that you're like, I'm not doing it again. Like very Got it. Scarlett O'Hara, right? Yeah. Like, I, well, we're seeing a lot of, entre- I've been reading a lot of articles lately is entrepreneurs in their 50s. Yeah. And especially women. We're seeing a lot of women entrepreneurs launching businesses. In so their I'd be 50s. curious how many of those are divorced. Be curious about how many of those, you know, like we're at a company. Well, that I don't. think divorced women at or nearing 50 are fantastic. So well, I, that's a great. Well, but market. I mean, it's a, but meaning that's an entrepreneurial, that's a Absolutely. trigger. That is Definitely a trigger. A trigger. Like I'm never a trigger. relying on anyone else again. I'm going to do it myself. Yeah. I had, um, I had a conversation recently with an advisor and she was talking about that. She works with a lot of divorced women and how many of them were kind of got to that divorce stage and were like, I've never done anything. I haven't worked. I've stayed home. I've been, you know, raising children and things like that. And they're almost forced into, where do you go when you're 45 and divorced? Most people do launch something or start a business or instead of going back into the corporate world. Yeah. Well, you've got more control because you talked about that, that limitation, right? You get to a certain point, you're like, that's all I'm going to make. Right. And that's, you know, <laughs> that was the thing is my biggest thing was I didn't want anybody telling me how much money I can make. Right. And, you know, you, you hit a salary, 29 hitting a salary cap, really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I remember the conversation and I think I got a 0.3% raise or something that year. And because of, of hitting up the limits and they're like, well, you know, you could continue to move up. And I'm like, I report to the CEO and I'm 20, where am I going? I mean, you <laughs> <Right>. know, what, <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of upward trajectory. And yeah. I kind of wanted something that I had more control of. It's not for everybody. Yeah. But, you know, it's I also didn't, you know, I'm probably one of the rebels that doesn't like to be told <laughs> that I can't do something. So I guess what category <laughs> That's that what puts happened. me in. So, yeah. you know, deciding to break out on your own nine years ago and be entrepreneurial. I mean, one of my favorite questions, and I'm curious if you even have an answer, because you seem like you've been pretty like confidently sure of where you were going to go no, and what you're going to do. Goodness, no. <laughs> but over that nine years, like what's something that that you wish you could go back and say, do this differently, think about this differently, do this sooner or later? I was, I mean, I felt confident that I would make it work. I didn't know how all the time. Um, I would say if I could go back, I would have recognized what I enjoy and what I love and who I love being around and what I was worth to those people sooner. And meaning that that is, I, I've, I like the reason I've started working with more and more women, like the financial space, I get. That's just, I know that industry really well, but I'm starting to branch more and more into working with those corporate and executive, corporate tip, I can't talk today, corporate and executive <laughs> women, um, because it's just, it's just the people I just get energy from. Like yeah. I love being around that group of people. And I always knew that, but I, I feel like at the beginning, launching a business is like all business is good business. Mm-hmm. And I think if I were to do it again, I would narrow my focus quicker mm-hmm. um, than I did. Yeah. And that's a fine balance because you talk about focus, right? And mm-hmm. uh, every entrepreneur, you're like, focus, like right. you got too much. And figuring out whether the focus is either too narrow or too broad, right? Because right? it's like, it, 
you you can go one way or the other. Right. You can be like, I'm going to be everything to everybody because I don't want to miss any opportunities. Exactly. Versus I'm only going to work with right. you know, females who are the age of 40 who've had the following things happen. Exactly. It's like, eh, you know, well, there's so. a middle ground because yeah. I, I, and part of it is is what you enjoy and what you're what you're passionate about. But the other thing is, like I mentioned, not all business is good business. If you've got a client or an engagement or something that's just draining you. I, you know, I'll tell my advisor clients, if you look at your calendar at the beginning of week and you see somebody on it that you're going, oh, <laughs> not this person. This what if you week. dread a whole day? No, I'm right. kidding. <laughs> well, they so, shouldn't be there. They shouldn't right. be a client, you know, and, and right. if you're working for a corporation, you may not have that choice. The right. beauty as an entrepreneur is you have that choice. Yeah, you don't so need if, a corporation. Well, yeah. like corporations, like, because I work with some companies that do the Fortune 500 Global 2000 thing. And one of my pet peeves is going yeah. to an hour meeting that took 15 minutes oh, and everybody's still thinking we got to fill the hour. I'm like, yes. we're done. I literally, this is horrible. We are so done. And I'm not going to name what meeting and I'm not going to name who I sent this to, but I have a, a friend and he and I both feel the same way and we're, we're in the same group and we were at a meeting um, this week and I literally texted him a picture that said, I survived another meeting that could have been an email. <laughs> And so, and I text it to him during the meeting. Yeah. And so we're both sitting there trying to look down and not look at our phone. Cause it, yes, is death by meeting. Yeah. But it's it, like, oh, it's on my calendar for an hour. And it's like, right. yeah, but it took us 10 or 15 minutes to discuss the meat of it. Right. I don't want to hear any more from you. <laughs> but that's where the opportunity, I mean, those are kind of, those are self-imposed limits mm -hmm. if you look at it, because we all have the authority to, not the authority, we all have the ability to stand up and go, okay, I think we got everything covered. Let's get to our days, you know? Right. So my my private coaching clients our meetings are an hour but sometimes we get done early yeah you know sometimes we've got to it and they've got a great strategy they're working on i'm like all right well let's go get to it right and it that's okay yeah i mean you just you just want to get the value and that's often more about the accountability anyway right i mean that's yeah. one of the things that working with someone like you helps yeah you know because it's just having an, an another person who right. tells you you're not limited by that you think you are right but why yeah right like exactly and that uh example i gave you earlier of where i was with a business partner who was sort of in that threatening way i went yeah. to dinner with someone and that person was like i don't understand why you think he's in charge and i was like you're right yeah i should think about true. this differently and that whole thing twisted it and i was yeah. like okay so i'm gonna but it takes talking yeah. to other people i talk about being an entrepreneur even if you don't have a real board of advisors you need yep. it you need a coach, you need an informal board of advisors, you need someone you can reach out to and yep. vet ideas because they're going to give you another way of thinking about it. They totally will. And it can be, I love the board of advisors idea. And I, you know, as a coach, I have a coach. I think coaches should. Um, but, you know, I have a, a list I call the Energizer list too. And there's about 20, 25 people on it, different ones. But one of them has to be on my calendar every week, even if it's just a phone call. Because yeah. not all of them are local. Right. But either I'm, I'm scheduling time to, you know, hey, I'm going to call you Tuesday at 2, let's grab 20 minutes or we're grabbing coffee or doing something because they're the people that I can, you know, talk about successes with. I can talk about challenges. They'll challenge me right back. Mm -hmm. But you, but they also, you leave the meeting feeling energized. Right. So it, as long as I've got one of those people on my calendar, the rest of the stuff, you know, hopefully it's a good week, but it kind of brings you back to reality a little bit. <laughs> makes you feel good at the end of the week. So. Okay. So all the things you've got, so you've got Andre Consulting Group. Yes. And you have the podcast called No Limits. No Limits. limits. Uh -huh which is all in line with your like, you yeah. got no limits and no limits is out. No limits on, that we can't overcome. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. So no limits is on you, you, once a week. We're once a week. So we, we broadcast on the Andre group Facebook page um, live on Tuesday nights at seven thirty, but it's on iTunes, Google play, Stitcher, Spotify, all that good stuff. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So we've been talking today with Kristen Andre. She's with Andre Consulting Group and also the host of No Limits podcast, which you should, can get to on her Facebook page. You've been listening to Build Your Best Business. What are you going to do until next time to build your best business? Yeah.